Today, in fact, I really want to talk about the, the Vulcan and the bombing raid from Ascension Island down to the Falklands during the Falklands War. The Falklands War lasted 74 days. The story that I'll tell you is, seems a bit of a sort of a boy's own thing, you know, it's terribly British. The war itself was a pretty nasty, horrible war. There were 255 UK personnel, service personnel killed, 775 wounded, 115 taken prisoner of war. On the Argentinian side, 649 killed, 323 of those in General Belgrano, the cruiser that was sunk by the Conqueror. 1,657 wounded and 11,313 prisoners of war. Uh, as far as hardware was concerned, there were two destroyers lost, the Sheffield and the Coventry, two frigates, Ardent and Antelope, landing craft, a container ship, and that container ship contained the 24 helicopters that were going to be transporting the two para and the others, in fact, to their designated battle areas, and 10 harriers that were going to be used for maintaining air defence. A nasty war. One of the guys that in two para wrote, uh, a couple of the guys have written books. One of them said it was a bit like the First World War. It was a case of getting rid of machine gun nests, clearing trenches, using bayonets and um, phosphorus grenades. And he said when you climb over into a machine gun, emplacement and you see what phosphorus grenades do to people he said it lives with you forever so you know that's why so many of our people have ended up with ptsd and that's why something like invictus games which i know a lot of you have been watching on the uh, on the tv is um, is so good anyway the boy's own story coming up a lot of you know from my previous talk my my background basically the royal air force from um, in the uk from 1961 to 1980 and then civil flying here in Australia from 81 to 98. Started off basic flying training on the, uh, on the Jet Provost, um, from there on to the Vampire T-11, and from there on to 617 Squadron as a co-pilot on, uh, on the Vulcan B Mark II. I think I mentioned last time, in fact, the story about the Lancaster at the main gate at Aria at Scampton. Underneath the Lancaster at the moment, you can see maybe just make out two bombs underneath there. They're tall boy bombs developed by Barnes Wallace and used very successfully during World War II. At the time in 1957-58 when the runway at Scampton was going to be extended, they decided to move what was there which was actually a Grand Slam bomb which weighs 22,000 pounds and they turned up with a 10,000 pound crane and tried to lift it <laughs> and found that um, it would not budge and they thought oh it's been filled with concrete anyway when the armourer checked he found that it was still loaded with torpex and still had live fuses in and if if it had gone off it would have not only flattened all of Aria Scampton but knocked down Lincoln Cathedral as well which had been standing since 1300 and something or other. Never trust the Air Force or the, or the Armourers. Just to give you an idea of the size of the aircraft, that's the squadron in front, that's when I was on 617 in front of our aircraft. The next picture is me with some hair which I don't have now. After my time on 617 as I said did a captain's tour on 83 squadron then went to um, Central Flying School and became a flying instructor. Did a tour at Church Fenton and then CFI of Oxford University Air Squadron and from there uh, staff job and then promoted um, squadron leader and back to back to Balkans again at Blooming Scampton. And that's me flying over Ark Royal. Um, just thought it's an interesting historic photograph of um, an aircraft that's no longer in service and a, a ship that's no longer in service. Right. Let's get on to the main part of the talk, which is the, the Falklands War. War was ever, never actually declared between the UK and Argentina. And they were called the Black Buck Missions against the runway at Port Stanley. And you think, well, why didn't they use the Harriers to just bomb the runway at Port Stanley? They did. But um, what... The, I mean, for a start, it was a bit of politics involved. The chief of the air staff could see that the Navy were getting all the glory from this war in the Falklands and wanted to uh, 
um, get the Air Force involved and the defence estimates were up. There was a new white paper out and uh, the Air Force was going to be a bit decimated and the Navy was going to be a bit decimated and I think the Chief of the Air Staff wanted to make sure that um, the Air Force, the RAF took part so therefore it wouldn't get quite so decimated um, in the long run when the discussions were finalised at the end of all this lot. And it was at the time the longest bombing raid in history. ...of the most daring bombing raid since the Dam Busters. Almost a one-way ticket. I didn't really see how we could survive it. The RAF's opening attack of the Falklands War, designed to strike terror into the hearts of the Argentinians. It was a secret, but very British mission. Monty Python couldn't have done it any better. The crew has never seen action before. Gulp, yes, it's us now. I must admit, I didn't like the idea of doing it. And all they have is an aging British bomber. It had a computer. This was driven by wheels, pulleys, bits of bicycle chain. The air electronics officer would have talked about the, uh, the bombing computer in the Vulcan. And he talked about cogs and wheels and bicycle chains and moving this um, system. It was in about a, um, a 44 gallon drum, about a 200 litre drum. That was about the size of it. Watch carefully, you can see the little cogs and wheels all moving up and down. Calculated a forward throw of the, of the bomb, helped the bomb aimer, the navigator radar, to decide when to release the bombs. To prepare, they learn techniques not used since World War II. And a lot of the work was done on a five pound pocket calculator bought in Swaffham Market. But it all seemed to be going so well. What, what can possibly go wrong? And then it did. It will be the longest bombing raid in history, if they succeed. BBC News at six o'clock. The Falkland Islands, the British colony in the South Atlantic, has fallen. That's what Argentina said. With the news that Argentina had seized the Falkland Islands, Britain's military bases were put on high alert. At precisely 10.15 this morning, HMS Invincible, flagship of this extraordinary fleet, slipped her moorings... At RAF Waddington, they watched Britain's mighty task force set sail to recapture the islands. As I mentioned, it is a bit sort of boys own British stuff, isn't it, really? Thanks to, uh, thanks to Channel 4. And Britain's commitment to this task force had begun. But they didn't think they'd be seeing any action. Our initial thought was, oh, dear me, um, but I can't see us being involved. Like most people, I heard about the invasion of the Falklands on the television or probably through radio news. I had not the faintest thought that we would be involved. Waddington had once been the home of Britain's nuclear V-Force. But the nuclear deterrent had been handed over to the Navy, and now the V-Force was facing extinction, not war. Its once shining fleet of nuclear Vulcan bombers was just three months away from being broken up by bulldozers. I think there was a feeling in the 80s, it was the end of an era. The Vulcans were closing down, they'd never been greatly improved and they weren't going to be improved now. But all that was about to change. Prime Minister! It is a government's objective to see that the islands are freed from occupation and are returned to British administration at the earliest possible moment. As Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher stirred the nation into a patriotic frenzy, behind the scenes head of the RAF, Sir Michael Beetham, went to see her with a cunning plan. She was very enthusiastic. And I said, well, we've got some more work to do, but hopefully we can do it. Beetham's plan was breathtakingly bold. To send a lone Vulcan bomber 8,000 miles down to the Falklands to blow up the runway at Port Stanley. 
At one stroke, it would stop the Argentinians using the runway as a base to attack the task force, and it would put the fear of God into the Argentinian people that the Vulcan might be back to bomb them. But there was a hitch. The Vulcan itself. Back in the coldest days of the Cold War, the Vulcan was state-of-the-art. It could be in the air within two minutes, delivering nuclear bombs into the heartlands of the Soviet Union. But, devised in the late 1940s by the designer of the Lancaster, the sinister tin triangle was now showing its age. Well, it was a very nice aircraft. High-tech, I'm not quite so sure. High-tech maybe when it came into service. I mean, I can certainly remember showing ex-Bomber Command people over the Vulcan in the 80s, and they'd say, oh, look at that, Fred, we had that over Berlin in 1944. The technology in the Vulcan was very old. They, they said they had a bombing computer. This was driven by wheels, pulleys, bits of bicycle chain, etc. There was nothing electronic in it. On Good Friday, RAF Waddington was told to prepare for war. At squadron level, people were starting to think, yes, there just might be the final hurrah coming up here. Suddenly, we were making this change from a peacekeeping role, albeit a rather strange one involving nuclear weapons, but a peacekeeping role, to one that would be a warfighting role. It was vital they destroyed the runway before the task force reached the Falklands. That left them just three weeks to get ready. But the challenges that lay ahead to get the old Vulcans fit for action looked insurmountable. There seemed to be so much that the Vulcan lacked and the crews lacked uh, when we were told that we were going to be flying for thousands and thousands of miles over the sea. The Vulcan was never really designed with that sort of mission in mind. The biggest hurdle was the sheer distance to the Falklands and back, 16,000 miles. They could use the British island of Ascension as a midway base, but that still left a round trip of 8,000 miles to the Falklands, double the Vulcan's maximum range. The only solution was to refuel the aircraft in the air. But no one had attempted this in a Vulcan for 20 years, and its refueling system no longer worked. Engineers raced to unblock the pipes and refit probes. They tore through rusty junkyards and scrapped aircraft, looking anywhere to find vital parts. Unless we could find them, the sortie was going to be a non-starter. We couldn't get there. <laughs> One crucial item was found in the crew room, being used as an ashtray. While the engineers patched the aircraft together, the crews assembled to discuss mid-air refueling. Somebody wisely said, have you ever done it before then? Uncle Neil, who was a little bit older than the rest of us, said, well, I had a gun, it was bloody awful, I tell you, it's the danger, most dangerous thing I've ever done. We said, oh yes, Neil, tell us more. But he said it was so dangerous, that's the reason the Vulcan stopped doing it. Which, uh, yeah, it was a great start, really. <laughs> Carrying out this dangerous manoeuvre meant flying within feet of the refuelling tanker. To take fuel, the pilot then had to try to stick the Vulcan's probe into a metal basket trailing behind. There's all sorts of expressions to, to talk about air-to-air -air refueling. Two insects mating in flight is, is one of them. It is, of course, arranging mid-air collisions between aircraft. Three of the top Vulcan crews were selected for training. But only one would fly the mission. The RAF did not have enough resources to refuel more than one Vulcan all the way to the Falklands. The chosen pilots were squadron leader Alistair Monty Montgomery, a charismatic and tough Scotsman. 
there was a rumour mill, mainly started by fighter pilots, that only fighter pilots could do this stuff of refuelling in the air. So we thought, hey, this is our chance, and we were desperate to have a go at it, believe me. Squadron leader John Reeve, also eager to have a crack at the runway. And I personally had absolutely no moral qualms whatsoever about doing this. And in terms of, you know, introspection, are we going to get away with this? Well, compared to having a go at Leningrad, uh, Port Stanley every time for me, please, if you don't mind. And lastly, the most junior of the bunch, Flight Lieutenant Martin Withers. I really genuinely thought that I was going to get through my whole time in the RAF without getting involved in any form of conflict, and without actually dropping a bomb on anybody in anger. And I must admit, I didn't like the idea of doing it. But do it, they must. And learning to refuel was just the first of many techniques they were going to have to master before they set off for war. Closing up behind a big tanker is really quite straightforward, but to actually get the probe into the basket was another matter. I spent the next 15 minutes missing to the left, missing to the right, missing below. Two, one, the crews soon find ways of describing the experience. Stabbing a wet donut, shoving very warm spaghetti up a cat's backside. Endless fun, frustrating until you get the hang of it. In peacetime, this would have taken months and months of intensive training. They only have two weeks. And if they fail, the task force would be at the mercy of Argentinian jets. With the Royal Navy Task Force now just two weeks away from the Falklands, the pressure was on. In charge of the Vulcan operation to bomb the runway at Port Stanley was Wing Commander Simon Baldwin. He lived on a diet of bacon sandwiches and pipe tobacco. I can't overemphasize how quickly things were happening. I had no time to think, we were just reacting. We were doing things and trying to make things work. Baldwin sent the crews on practice runs to attack the island of Garvey off the coast of Scotland. The crews had been skillfully trained to drop nuclear bombs, but it had been 10 years since they'd done any conventional bombing. Now they had to relearn techniques that dated back to World War II, using the same iron bombs dropped from Lancasters. We dropped these bombs and you felt them go off, sort of, underneath you. And it was pretty exciting stuff just to do that without anyone shooting at you. The crews loved it, but the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds were understandably not happy. And the RSPB were absolutely devastated that we were wiping out seagulls at Garvey Island and requested that we stop doing it immediately. We, we were trying to go to war, but they didn't seem to appreciate that. We felt very sorry for the seagulls. He lies. <laughs> <laughs> The crews were going to have to hit a runway just 120 feet wide. This demanded a degree of accuracy not normally required with nuclear bombs. With the Vulcan, the accuracy that we had, we'd be quite lucky to hit the runway at all. And while the crew might miss the target, it looked increasingly likely that the Argentinians would hit the Vulcan. When Baldwin received the latest intelligence on the air defences at Port Stanley, it made sober reading. The dossier revealed that the Argentinians had state-of-the-art weaponry, including the Tiger Cat, built by the British. We were going in against the Argentinians with really modern radar-laid guns, uh, big shells, 
uh, explosive shells that they could fire at uh, goodness only knows how many per second, which could easily shoot uh, a Vulcan out of the sky. And going in at low level at night, I didn't really see how we could survive it. Crews were told to make their wills. You can't get around the fact it's a war. And you write out your will and you take the dog for a walk around Harmston Village and you think, I wonder if I'll ever see that place again. Right, should you be uh, captured at all, and uh, they will give you the opportunity to write a letter. And in case they did survive and were captured, they were taught how to write secret coded messages. Southwards, the government has given more details of the merchant ships. With the task force a week away from the Falklands, Mrs. Thatcher still hoped that regular TV updates showing that the British meant business would be enough to send the Argentinians packing. Troops have been going through their weapons drill in readiness for a possible landing on the Falklands. The Royal Air Force has already shown pictures of their Vulcan bombers converted from the nuclear bombing role to that of conventional bombers. Exhausted from round-the-clock training, the Vulcan crews now found that their supposedly secret mission was part of that message. Watch out, the Brits are coming. To reach the Falklands, they would have to fly the bombers from Ascension Island, refueling them in midair. Our attitude to it was, oh great, why don't you give them the date and time? You've given them everything else. Soon, they would be off to war. The two Vulcan crews prepared to take off for their midway base on Ascension Island. It was a miracle. In just three weeks, Waddington had gone from a peacetime base onto a full war footing. Transforming near obsolete bombers into new fighting machines. Eight hours later, the two Vulcans were circling the British island of Ascension. This remote volcanic outpost was a perfect base for the attack on Port Stanley. Ascension Island was, was amazing. It was just unbelievable. I still can remember just sort of circling around and seeing this strange looking island, a volcanic island. It looked like one big slag heap, really, on the uh, western side, very unattractive. The place was heaving, absolutely heaving. It really was something where something was happening. You think, oh, quite pleased to be part of this. Ascension had become the busiest airport on the planet. The Vulcans arrived to find a huge armada of 12 Victor aircraft, the refueling tankers that would take the Vulcan down to the Falklands. Later that morning, the RAF sent a signal. The mission, codename Operation Blackbuck, was on for 11 o'clock that night. It was time for one final check on the Vulcan's payload. Suddenly you're looking at 21, 1,000 bombs, and you realize that that means business. It was going to take a staggering 11 Victor tankers to refuel the one Vulcan on its 8,000-mile round trip. Group captain Jeremy Price led the team to thrash out a plan. The refueling plan was very, very complex. It was something that had never been tried before, and a lot of the work was done on a five-pound pocket calculator bought in Swaffham Market. The plan is that this vast armada flies to the first refueling point. Half the victors refuel the other half, one victor refuels the Vulcan, and then those aircraft return to base. The procedure is repeated at the next refueling point, and again, until there's just one victor left to refuel the Vulcan before its final run into the target. 
And it was really a question of victors refueling, victors refueling, victors refueling, and it went on and on and on. And all the time, the formation was being reduced as one victor had given all its fuel and had to go back to Ascension. We had never seen anything like this refueling plant. The real unknown was just how much fuel that Vulcan is going to burn. We used the best information we had, but we had a, a horrible nagging feeling that it might not be good enough. If they'd got the plan wrong, aircraft could end up ditching in the freezing South Atlantic Ocean with no hope of rescue. The air crews assembled for the final briefing on Ascension Island. OK, gentlemen, this is a secret briefing. In a few hours, the mission to bomb the runway at Port Stanley would be taking off on the 8,000-mile round trip. Give me at the back. Yeah. Right, well, as you know, the reason that we're here is to have a look at the whole refueling operation. It was the most complicated refueling plane I'd ever seen. To be honest, I picked up probably 60% of what was going on. Two hours, it's difficult to be I, I couldn't take it all in. It would take me ages, but I was able to turn to Dick Russell and say to him, Did you, do you understand that? And I had to draw a breath and say, uh, well, yes, I do, uh, with my fingers crossed behind my back. And these are the final points to remember. So and from that, cup of tea, disperse, out to the aircraft, ready to go. For lead John Reeve and his crew, it would be a hard 16 hours ahead. For reserve Martin Withers' his crew, it was supposed to be four hours and back for a beer. But that's if Withers could get into the air. He already had a problem. The microphone in his helmet, his bone dome, had stopped working. My first time going to war and uh, my bone dome doesn't work. And I like my bone dome, I had that sense of security in it. In the back, Gordon Graham, the navigator, was also having to make do. The RAF didn't have any maps of the South Atlantic. Our navigator finished up using a, a map of the Northern Hemisphere turned upside down. Gordon changed the Azores into the Falklands. When we started the launch on that night, um, I felt that we had about a 40% chance of, uh, of success. There was almost a silence. But you could feel this air of expectancy. And then, bang. A victor started up, and another, and another. And the noise grew and grew and grew. There was a sudden change in the noise, and it was the first Vulcan starting. The Vulcan just looked fabulous, menacing, full of authority as it taxied onto the runway. I mean, I was desperately sorry not to be in it. But I had a lump in my throat as it went off down the runway, followed by the second one. 2306, second volcano. 2306, blue section, primary And then they were gone, and there was silence. In radio silence, to make sure there were no listening ears that could alert the Argentinians, the vast armada set off for the Falklands. But in the lead Vulcan, it wasn't about to be Reeves' night. Monty Python couldn't have done it any better. It all seemed to be going so well. The engines have started, the aircraft's working. What, what can possibly go wrong? I could hear this hissing sound from the window. We got airborne, the whistling got worse, and the indication said the aircraft isn't pressurising. And I thought, no, no, it's happened once before in nine years on the V-Force. It can't be happening now. And it was. With no cabin pressure, Reeve and his crew will slowly freeze and run out of oxygen. 
There's no official drill for what to do, but you try all the things you can think of. We had sandwiches in polythene wrapping. I got the polythene off and tried to jam that in. I think I tried to jam a flying jacket, anything in there to try and stop it. But that's not working. Of course, we had to turn back then. Obviously not a happy bunny. Just four minutes after takeoff, and it's all starting to unravel. Reeve breaks radio silence to say he's returning to base. On the backup Vulcan, Withers also hears the transmission. We were now the primary Vulcan. We were on, and there was a deathly silence. Nobody actually said anything. Gulp, yes, it's us now. So I, I came up with a real sort of boy's own statement, like... Looks like we've got a job of work to do, fellas. The success of the whole mission now rests on Withers and his crew. Withers starts refueling with the victors. It's the first of four contacts over the eight-hour journey to the Falklands. But when the empty victors start returning to Ascension, they make a terrible discovery. The aircraft are so low on fuel, they have barely made it back. The victors coming back made it quite clear that the Vulcan is using more fuel than we have calculated. We were worried. I was worried. With not enough fuel, the whole mission is in jeopardy. But in radio silence, Withers in the Vulcan is blissfully unaware of the impending disaster. We weren't really keeping an eye on how much fuel we got. And it's a bit like, you know, in a, in a motor race, you know, that you just go around and as long as you've got fuel in the tank, that's all you're worried about. Then, with two refuelings left, the sortie hits a major electrical storm. It's always the same when you, the chips are down, you run into turbulence. And did we run into turbulence? And it's now that the last two remaining victors must refuel. Flying in the rear victor, Bob Tuxford knows if he can't get fuel, the mission is over. I was becoming acutely aware that the whole success of the mission now rested on the shoulders of, of me and my crew. A miracle happened. Contact. I couldn't believe it. He, not only did he get in, he stayed in. Yep, fuel flows again. That's it. <laughs> Bob Tuxford, I take my hat off. Good job, Bob. But as Tuxford's Victor completes refueling and flies out of the storm, the crew make an alarming calculation. There isn't enough fuel. We were well short, to the point where we wouldn't actually be able to make the island back at Ascension. Tuxford asks the crew what they want to do. Right, uh, we either turn back now, pretty sharpish, or at least press on in the knowledge that we've got to come up with some sort of alternate plan. Without hesitation, each one of my four crew members said that we've come this far, we'll press on. Their decision means that they may be forced to ditch with little hope of rescue. Six and a half hours since leaving Ascension, it's time for the final refuel. But Tuxford, in the Victor, can't risk breaking radio silence to tell the Vulcan there's barely enough fuel to complete the mission. And then, much to my surprise and Dick's surprise, sitting beside me, they put the light on. OK, Annie, give him the light. The red light flashed, and so we had to break. If the red light flashed, you break. Come what may, you break. Ready, though. How much of this given us? But I said, this must be a mistake. The 5,000 pounds, Captain because, you know, we'd still need about another 7,000 pounds of fuel. We, we'll have to abort the mission. The Vulcan had expected a full tank. 
but they've had all the fuel the Victor tanker can spare. So we broke off. I was absolutely amazed and, and actually very annoyed because I couldn't believe they could do that to us. As the Victor turns to head back to Ascension, a furious Withers briefly breaks radio silence. We received two words. We're off. Which sounded like, we're off. What does he mean, we're off? Was he off to attack the target? Or was he off to Ascension? We felt dejected. We felt that all our efforts had been in vain. In the Vulcan, Withers faces the hardest decision of his life, whether to give up the attack or press on and gamble the lives of his crew. Captain Martin Withers and his crew are within striking distance of the runway at Port Stanley. But their Vulcan bomber doesn't have enough fuel to get back to base. In theory, we should have then gone back to Ascension and aborted the whole attack. But because we'd come this far and the whole force had come this far, Martin decided we would carry on. Withers takes the Vulcan down to 300 feet to get under the Argentinian radar. But navigator Gordon Graham can't work out exactly where they are. All his navigation systems are showing different positions. If we don't know where we are relative to the island, we could bomb anywhere. We could bomb the town itself. They switch on the ground scanning radar to get a fix. But this risks the Vulcan being picked up by the Argentinian defenses. Withers chances taking the Vulcan higher to see if that will help. Bang! The Falkland Islands appeared right in the middle of the radar screen, only about a mile away from where we uh, thought we were. However, just as we got up to about 500 feet, I suddenly picked out a search radar. The Argentinians have spotted them. But there's no turning back. Withers must now climb up for the final run-in. Pulled up using full power, fairly steep climb, to get to 10,000 feet. We had about a 20-mile run-in, but we felt very vulnerable because you're sitting there. Uh, they know you're there. I had pulled the visor covers down. We thought flat would be coming up at us, you know, like you see in the war films. We hadn't done this before. Getting fairly close, we suddenly got a lock-on from one of their fire control radars. So I thought, what can I do? So I switched on the Dash 10 jamming pod so that they'd be fooled into thinking we were in a different position. I opened the bomb doors early to make sure there wasn't a problem with the doors themselves. Alive, Nav radar Bob Wright checks the antique bombing computer. Its pulleys and bicycle chains must calculate to the split second when to release the bombs. Five. As we got to about two miles away Four. and the airfield was still lit up, that's when the bombs started to drop off. Three, two, one. And they dropped off at half-second intervals, 21 bombs. From 10,000 feet, it'll take 20 seconds for the bombs to hit the ground. Once the last bomb went, Martin pulled the stick, uh, climbing turn to the left to get away from any Argentinian air defence threats. The sky opened up a short while after that with every gun blazing. And as we climb, you could see the flashes, obviously from the bombs going off. Now I felt a bit sorry for uh, the people on the ground. I mean, uh, not every day in your life you drop live bombs on... on, on somebody. We had no idea at that point whether the bombs had actually hit the runway. It was a real sort of uh, all over, you know, I'm, I'm safe now, uh, even though, yeah, we still did have quite a major problem to, to cope with. 
They still have to find their refueling tanker in thousands of square miles of Atlantic, and they have only a few hours of fuel left. But just as they thought they were out of range of Argentinian missiles, the whole of my radar warning receiver front sector lit up with threat. Unsure whether they are friend or foe, every anti-aircraft weapon of the British task force is now trained on the Vulcan. And I said a little prayer, hoping that uh, somebody on board the ships was aware that we were a friendly coming towards them. This is one Quebec Delta, over. I opened up on my radio, passed the pleasantries of the day, good morning, and I passed the code word superfuse to uh, let them know that we considered the attack had been a success. The task force stands down while the code word is also picked up 4,000 miles away back on Ascension. Suddenly out of the blue somebody shouted superfuse. I mean fantastic. I mean there was there was elation everywhere. In Bob Tuxford's Victor rapidly running out of fuel the Vulcan's transmission tells them that at least their efforts were not in vain. There was elation in our aeroplane. The whole mood changed. Well, let's hear it for the tin triangle. And after all, we were able to say, well, he's done it. He's done the job. Time is also running out for the crew of the Vulcan. There's no sight of the refueling tanker they're supposed to rendezvous with. The co-pilot stated he'd never seen a Vulcan flying with so little fuel in its tanks, which was quite a frightening situation to be in. We knew we had to make contact. If we didn't make contact, we were in the sea. We had immersion suits to keep us dry. We had dinghies. We had little radios. But I don't think any of us would have survived unless an absolute miracle happened. And the next thing I know, the Victor rolled out right in front of us. To me, at the time, it was the loveliest sight in the world. Just in time, Tuxford's Victor was also met by a refueling tanker. There were quite a few whoops and hollers in the aeroplane as, as people celebrated. And as the Vulcan neared ascension, it was time for them to celebrate too. There to meet Martin Withers with a can of beer was the pilot, Bob Tuxford. As I fought my way through the crowds, I'm not sure that Martin even recognized me in the first instance. But nevertheless, he received the can of beer nicely, and I decided that we'd done our bit that night. We didn't hear that whether we'd hit the runway until at least 24 hours later. We dropped 21 bombs, and the first one to, to explode was on the runway. The bomb put an end to Argentinian ambitions to use the runway for fast jet attacks on the task force. But it had been a close call. Just half a second later in releasing the bombs, and they might have missed altogether. The impact of that one bomb was to be felt far beyond Port Stanley Airfield. We had made a statement. We'd made a, a huge statement that we were not giving up the Falkland Islands. Once that first bomb tumbled out of Martin's bomb bay, it, it's a declaration of war. And really, it was the opening shot of hostilities, and there was no going back. For Sir Michael Beetham, the raid had achieved its ultimate goal. The effect on the Argentinians was they could see that if we could do that, we could also do much more. Frightened that their cities would be attacked, the Argentinians withdrew their fighters to the mainland. The result was fewer Argentinian air attacks on British troops and ships. But for the Vulcan, the Falklands War was its first and last action. Six months after the war, it was scrapped. Withers Vulcan 607 now rests in peace beside the runway at Waddington, where, almost 30 years ago, it raced off to the Falklands. It's because I just put up a few pictures here of the gear that we used to wear in the Vulcan. And you have a personal equipment connector into which that pipe goes. It goes into the side of the ejector seat and it blows air 
around you to keep you warm or keep you cool. Over the top of that, if you're going to be flying over the Atlantic, then you've got a, a bunny suit. And over the top of that, you've got an immersion suit. And in the days when we were flying up at 48 and 50,000 feet, you had a pressure jerkin and then the bone dome and here's the one of the poor rear crew guys and the escape trainer coming down the down the access door it was um, much more pleasant flying for ANSET where i could sit there in my shirt sleeves and um, ej would bring me a cup of coffee or something <laughs> that's it thank you very much indeed and all that because maggie thatcher said this lady's not for turning i mean it was the it was the military junter in uh, Argentina, General Galtieri and his crew were having a big popularity problem and, at the time and one of the things dear to the hearts of most of the people in Argentina are the Falkland Islands or what they call the Malvinas. So the military junta thought here's a good way of getting ourselves popular again. We'll go and take the Malvinas back from the, from the British even though the British have been there since 1855 and all the people on the island spoke English and wanted to stay British. The Argentinians thought this would be a good way of making the military junta a lot more popular. And of course, when you run up against the Iron Maiden or the Iron Lady in the shape of Margaret Thatcher, you really have a lady who is not for turning. And despite the, uh, the advice that she was given, that really the British task force stood very little chance of success, she did it anyway. A very brave decision, because it came from the Cabinet Office, it came from Margaret Thatcher to sink the Belgrano. In hindsight, it was the right decision to make. The Argentinian Navy never showed its face out on the ocean again after that. It stayed behind. The Vulcan raid down there was um, also of use because it showed that the aircraft bases in mainland Argentina were within range. They were not within range of the Harriers um, off the um, Hermes and the Invincible. Incidentally, the Invincible was going to be sold by the British to the Australians, but that never happened. It was the right decision and it all worked out right in the end. Although, having read Admiral Sandy Woodward's book, because he was the, the force commander, he reckoned that four more bombs and we would have lost. And the reason for that was that the Ardent, for example, a bomb was released, but um, it just went straight through the side of the ship. There were no injuries. There was one guy who's never quite the same again because apparently he was walking along the corridor when this bomb went straight through, <laughs> right, in, right in front of him. And I think he either had brown pants or was whatever, but he, um, he is never, never quite the same afterwards. Woodward reckon that if four more bombs had gone off instead of going through, the, and the reason they went through was because the Harriers were very effective. Um, they forced the Argentinians to go in very low and they weren't able to release the bombs until they were very close and they didn't have time to arm. Having not armed, they just either hit or bounced or went through, as in the case of Ardent. But as it was, of course, the Atlantic conveyors were sunk with all those helicopters and all those Harriers on. And um, you have to take your hat off to Two Para and the rest of the, the soldiers for the, the way that they trekked their way across. The Americans said it couldn't be done, but they hadn't counted on the British. Oh, what was the Vulcan like to fly? It was a, um, a very exciting, very maneuverable aeroplane. All right, if we we're going to do a display in a Vulcan, the weight of the aeroplane, we, we talked in pounds in those days, so I'll, I'll stick to pounds now. The weight of the aeroplane with the crew and that on board was 104,000 pounds. And it was roughly about 110 feet wingspan and about 105 feet long. Put 20,000, 25,000 pounds of fuel on board, and so you're up at a weight around 130. The um, Bristol Olympus engines that we had, the 300 series engines, produced 22,000 pounds of thrust each. So you've got 88,000 pounds of thrust, so you've got a pretty good power to weight ratio at 130. When we were part of the great white detergent, the great white deterrent um, force on quick reaction alert, we were fueled up with 88,000 pounds of fuel um, and we had a 
16,000-pound blue steel missile slung underneath the aircraft, mm. and so we were up around 204,000 pounds, and the airplane still climbed away perfectly well, no problem. There was one guy who was one of the training captains on the on the OCU, on the operational conversion unit, who demonstrated the uh, the power of the aircraft by um, um, doing a, just using one engine, in fact, to do a touch and go. Mm -hmm. Stupid thing to do. I mean, nobody in their right mind would do that, but he did just to show how much power the aircraft had got. Why? God only knows. He should have been sacked, but anyway, that's what he did. <laughs> what speed did that check? Um, Approach speed around about, um, again, depending on your weight, about 140 knots. The minimum length of runway for us was 6,000 feet, and um, normally if we were landing on 6,000 feet, we'd use the brake parachute. How many bombs actually hit the runway? One. <laughs> um, the bombing run was designed to go across the runway, rather than go along the runway. If it had gone along the runway, and everyone had been successful, then there would have been a lot more holes in the runway. But the whole point of the exercise was, in fact, to make it clear to the Argentinians that the main bases for their aircraft operations on mainland Argentina were now within range of uh, the British forces. And as a result of that, not only did they keep their navy in, and not as a result of that, but you know, after Belgrano, they kept their navy in, in port, but they also kept um, a lot of their fighters and protection aircraft on, on mainland Argentina, just in case. Mirage was, was the main fighter that they had. They've got the Super Etantar, which they carried the Exocet missile. And that was another real worry because the Exocet was very effective. And they had five of them as far as the task force knew. In fact, they had seven. You know, we have to blame the bloody French for that, don't we? No, French aeroplane. Yeah, French aeroplane, French, French missile. They've always been the traditional enemies of the British, haven't they? <laughs>my mate Neil McDougall, his um, in-flight refueling pro broke <coughs> and you know he was either going to put the aircraft down in the sea or in fact he was going to have to um, try and find somewhere else to go. They were very very short of fuel. Uh, they opened the door and dropped their nav bags their, and of course you know they would have lost their watches and various other things. <laughs> all, all sorts of stuff got lost down, down the side and, um, and into the ocean. Unfortunately they couldn't um, jettison the sidewinder, one of the sidewinder missiles that they had attached to the um, to the aircraft. Um, so they landed at, um, at Rio. They were uh, immediately taken into custody um, and put up in one of the best hotels in Rio. <laughs> and were told to, that they had to remain incommunicado. So Neil thought, I wonder if the telephone works. <laughs> and he picked it up. He picked up the telephone and it worked. And so he rang his wife back in Scampton and said, Hello, love, I'm in Rio. Do you think you can let the boys know in operations where I am? And what's going on? Everybody, everybody's fine. I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but, um, you know, the, the suite I'm in is pretty good. Yeah, something like that anyway. I mean, Neil expanded the story.